everyone. Welcome to Wandering DMs. I'm Paul. And I'm Dan, and on this episode of Wandering DMs, we're going to be talking about some dice mechanics and possibly some statistics, Paul. Did you, did you know we were preparing for that? I, I, I had a clue as Dan was, <laughs> was writing code up until the last possible second in preparation for this. Uh, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm guessing there are going to be some good bugs, some, some, uh, some incorrect numbers. It's going to be great. <laughs> it's going to be great. Yep. It's going to be great. So... You know, last week we were talking about dice manufacture and what they look mm -hmm. like and what kinds of options are on the market and things like that. And so what we didn't get a chance to talk about is how they get used in the game so yep. much. So let's let's take a re-roll with advantage <laughs> and see if we can't talk about dice mechanics here awesome. on episode 49 of season two of Wandering DMs. That and more today on Wandering DMs. Woo! <laughs> Let me start with this big picture question, Dan. Why do we yes. roll dice in role-playing games? What a wonderful, deep question, Paul. Let me, let me, and, and when, you, when you told me you were going to ask that at the outset, I, yeah. there's, there's, I think there's two possible interpretations of that question. Do you mean, why do we want randomness at all? Or do you mean, why do we use dice for randomness instead of other things? Um, I was thinking, why do we need randomness at all? Right? There are games that don't use it at all, right? That exists. They're diceless games. There are games that are pure, you know, pure role play storytelling that just have no random element whatsoever. I'm sure that there are some people that would look at that and go, uh, we're not entirely sure that is a game uh, without some kind of random element. Uh, you know, that's maybe that's storytelling. Maybe that's maybe that's improv. Uh, some people without without games wouldn't uh, may, may dispute that that actually is a game, perhaps. But um, you know, a friend of the you know friend of the show, James Malashevsky, uh, has talked about the oracular power of dice in the past. Yep. And I suppose this turns it you know this supposedly this could turn into a philosophical conversation about as we model something like the world in our game. Do we think that the world is entirely an internal construct that people make entirely out of themselves? Or we do, do we think that there is a world beyond us outside of this that we Great. don't have complete Great. control over? Great. And so for those of us, you know, for those of us who do think that there is some kind of outside reality that we should practice interfacing with, that we don't get to, to choose deterministically, then random numbers are a pretty good way of simulating the outsidedness of the universe that is beyond us. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> I wasn't expecting existential at questions at the start of a, of a show about dice. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, you should really start expecting that more, Paul, frankly. You should, you should, I'm reminded, you should expect it more often. I'm reminded of a great Carl Sagan quote at the beginning of one of the episodes of Cosmos where he said, in order to make an apple pie, first we must create the universe. <laughs> so. What a great quote. Now, the other thing that was on my mind, what a great, great quote. You know, the other thing that was on my mind, of course, one of the most famous um, quotes from Albert Einstein when he was grappling with the rise of quantum mechanics, uh, you know, disputing the, the upcoming, you know, interpretation of quantum mechanics is he said, God does not play dice with the universe. Mm. And uh, the retort from Niels Bohr was, Einstein stopped telling God what to do. So <laughs> mm, that's so great. It does, that's it does great. get all the way down yeah, to yeah, what is yeah, the nature yeah. of reality? Is okay. the nature of reality fundamentally deterministic or is it fundamentally right. random? I have totally had, like with really good friends, debates over which, which and, and, to, and I was really surprised by both of us really thought that the other camp was nuts. <laughs> that was clearly, how could you possibly believe the opposite? Oh, that's great. Um, that's great. And you know what? As someone who has grown up playing D&D &D with dice, I got to admit, yeah. my perspective of what the universe is like and even my interpretation of quantum mechanics has been colored by expecting the universe to be random so right. you know, so but I at minimum we could say so at minimum we could say that the the reason we use dice in role-playing games is to inject randomness right right 
Right. Okay, that's great. I mean, I think Obviously. that you and I both agree that one of the most delightful things as a DM is having the players inject chaos, right? So that the players, mm -hmm. you know, will often do things that as DM you didn't expect and take the game in a totally different random direction than you than you anticipated when you were designing the game. And that to some degree, at least from the DM's perspective, to some degree that's an injection of randomness, right? Not sure I'm convinced yeah, about that. Yeah, okay. Not sure I'm okay. convinced about that. I mean, one thing I must say is that a couple people in our chat, like William and Joshua, are obviously pointing out well-known games that don't have random elements, yep. like chess or checkers or the possibility of comparing stats or something like that. I will point out that historically, at one point, chess did include dice, and so we might we might go back in time and find people who were big chess players at one point who wouldn't recognize the deterministic chess that we have. Um, uh, well, okay, and, th and then there's some other questions I'm not going to get into, William, because, because they've turned into whole hour-long conversations yeah, in the yeah. past. I'm not going to get into, in, into other questions. Okay, uh, but, but the uh, point I'm not is... Entirely sure that people, I'm not entirely sure that player chaos is randomness. Okay. Um, I'm not entirely sure I trust that. Okay, but it is at least chaos, right? And that's like it's it's oh, yeah. chaos. It's an injection of chaos, right? Oh, yeah. And that's my point uh, that I was trying to get at here was that, um, you know, I think primarily the reason we use dice in a role playing game is to inject randomness and create chaos and create mm -hmm. the unknown, right? And bring the unknown into our game. Uh, or the unexpected. Great. I would yeah. I, I would say and to model uh, to model the 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 unknownness of the world. Yeah, that's a good. Uh, point. Uh, yep. 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 Right. I, I think it was I think it was the famous Bishop Butler who whatever it was three hundred years ago said you know if there was an omniscient entity they wouldn't need statistics they wouldn't need probability hmm. only finite finite mortals in the world with limited information need to talk about probability as our way of encapsulating the limit the the limited knowledge that we have about the world so i would say that the dice and the probability models limited knowledge about the world great 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 okay so let's let's start from let's go from there i think and start to dig into how the, the raw mechanics then of how we bring that into our games with dice right like we talked uh last week when we we're talking about like the design of dice we talked a lot about sort of like percentiles versus d20s and the, sort of the range of numbers and and how a lot of the early uh desire for dice uh, that affected their design was this ability to get down to a percentage uh, generator, right? That like that you know th that D twenty is pretty good because it gives you increments of five percent, and perhaps a lot of games went to raw percentile because just because we uh, from a statistical analysis perspective we understand one to a hundred percent, right? <clears throat> like that's that's a thing that makes sense to our brains a lot better than than other things like say. You know, with D6s, which are, what is that, 12.5% per bit, something like that? 16 and 2 thirds. 16 2 thirds. Thank you. There you go. Um, but I would also say if you want to compare to, uh, if you want to pull up real world documentation, it's, it's commonly in percentages. So if you yeah. want to directly apply or compare to real world percentages, we have lots and lots of information and documentation like that, too. Yeah. Right. Okay. So one of the one of the big mechanical differences we talked about uh, in the design side is sort of uh, linear rolls. Uh, so so a d20 or a percentile based system versus say like a dice pool system, which is going to through multiple dice convert your 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 random number generation into a into a curve, right? Right. <clears throat> um, and I think one of the interesting things that maybe impacts that choice of what do you want here, you know, you're you're looking at um, you know, on one hand, I think there's an argument for does it actually realistically model the universe, which is, you know, one thing that we want, versus how comprehensible is it on the fly, right? How quickly yeah. can I look and look yes. at the dice and say, I expect or don't expect this to work? Exactly, exactly. I think that's a major point. You know, let me read, let me, let me, before uh, I get in that, let me read a, a, a quote from uh, uh, John Peterson's Playing at the World here, where he talks about the moment where, um, having had a whole bunch of D6s for war mm -hmm. games through the 60s, and wanting to replicate percentages, people were starting to have these more and more complicated tables of rolling a bunch of D6s in order to match those percentages, or taking sums or something like that. 
and then the desire, as you're saying, Paul, to switch to a D20 to better match those percentages. Um, and so John writes at this point, the suitability of, say, 2D6 for accuracy dice warrants some closer scrutiny, however. Most Americans of the era who threw 2D6 did so while playing Monopoly, a game that likely derives its dice system from the ancient game of backgammon. Gygax surely knew, as we can ascertain from the previous section, that the probability distribution for pairs of dice favors sums in the middle disproportionately. <coughs> Thus, the accuracy dice for chainmail are far more likely to roll a 7 than a 12. The resulting bell curve creates all sorts of anomalies when you aim to roll over a given number. For example, a modifier that adds or subtracts one from the sum of the throws can skew the results by different percentages depending on what the dice yield. Uh, designers can scale the requirements to hit accordingly, but the subtle differences in likelihood may not be apparent to the players themselves. Yeah, yeah. Um, so very cognizant at the outset of why are we using a d20 specifically to get away from multiple dice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's actually mm -hmm. why the d20 was used in D&D in the first place. And so I think a, um, a motivational point is, should the players be able to estimate the probabilities? Should the players know what the chances are that they're going to succeed? Or should that be hidden from them in an immersive uh, vein. Hmm. How do you feel about that, Paul? Like, what is your? What, I mean, I, I like. I feel. I feel. I see. You know, some people get irritated when the players are computing probabilities at the table, and I. I know. I mean, I recall very fondly there was yeah. a time where you were rolling, you know, dragon breath damage in front yeah, of me, yeah, and I yeah. very quickly out loud went one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's an eight hit die dragon. Yeah, and yeah. you were like, damn it, and you scooped up the dice and tried to take it off the table. How, how, well, how that's much? not that's different, though. That's not computing okay, probability, okay. right? That that okay, is right. that is using a tell of the mechanic <laughs> to to you know to to, to to determine the exact stats of the creature. Okay, right. Randy? I generally don't want the the precise stats of the creature to be known, but in terms of probability, right? Like, because I guess there's a lot of different things that we roll for, right? If a player is trying to swing their sword or something, or or just jump a cliff. Right, and and it really is coming down just purely to skill. It's basically, the character skill. I mean, right. So right. so it's just based on the numbers on the player character sheet. Then I think that they probably should be able to, you know, calculate probability. They want to know: is my character okay. good at this or not? Right? Okay. Is this a particularly okay. hard attempt? Right? Is this yeah. is this something that is right. within an easy range of my character's abilities or a very difficult one? Right. Right. And I think well, that's are there, reasonable. Are there are there situations where you would not want them to know clearly? Only, only, up? only when there are factors that they shouldn't know about. I think, right? Right. 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 You don't realize that this monster has magically hardened skin, so you know you should not realize that. In fact, you know your your sword swing is going to bounce off of it, or likely to bounce, more likely to bounce off of it because it's got an invisible magical enchantment, something. Right. Right. How do you feel about, um, I don't know, like you're playing D&D and you walk up to someone in chain mail and a shield and a helmet. Um, should the player know what their armor class is? Hmm. I think roughly. Like should the player know the target? Yeah. 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 Why not? Do, I mean, you, do you actually tell your players what the AC of the target is out loud? No, but also they won't know precisely, right? Again, in that case, right. I would think somebody would right. say, oh, he's wearing chainmail, it's probably AC5. But, right. you know, maybe he's got a dex modifier. Right. Maybe right. he's wearing magical gear. Right. right. There's There are unknowns. I would, in fact, I would, if, if like, really pressed on it, if somebody was like, well, I know what, I know, I also wear chainmail, so I should know exactly what his armor class is. I would be right. happy to tell the player, well, the armor class of chainmail is five. Right. Right. You know, do with now, that information seen, as you will. Yeah, I mean, I've seen online, I mean, and I haven't really seen anybody play this way, but I've seen online people express surprise at anyone not announcing the specific armor class of the, the opponent. Really? Uh, I've seen people say, I've always played by just announcing the armor class or writing it on the whiteboard or something like that yeah. publicly and, and be surprised that anyone doesn't actually explicitly name the target number all the time. Now, I've done that when... 
uh, we're deep into a fight, and I feel like by now you probably should have sussed out this information. And really, I'm giving yeah. I'm giving it to you just as a means of uh, making the the speed of the game more efficient, right? Like, right. oh, right. you're 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 fighting an army of lizard men. You figured out that they're all AC seven, so just know that and roll your dice. Tell me if you hit or not. Right, right, right. And I see Eric in the chat saying he does the same thing as you yeah. apparently. Um, uh, which is interesting, and we had—I mean, we had a—we had a close friend uh, back when we started playing Third Edition. We, we were all coming from different campaigns and different play styles, where we had a dispute initially over exactly that, over whether it was expected that the DM would always tell the players the exact the exact target value they needed in combat. Where, where do you um, stand on that? Dan? To that. Do, do you want you, you? You don't want to tell them the exact I'm, target. I don't. Yeah, I don't. Uh, at least that's not my habit. It's not my habit. Uh, I am a hundred percent delighted when players uh, triangulate that number and yep. communicate to each other at the table. I figured out what the armor class is. That just makes me very, very happy that they've done that uh, right. Encyclopedia Brown type type yeah. work for it. <laughs> um, and the funny thing is, is that there are some players that come to to play with me. And their expectation is that that would be sanctioned as meta gaming, and they they act they figure it out, and then they don't say it to other players because mm. they assume that I'll be the crew. Mm. Um, so there's a lot of different table cultures around that, Interesting. and I, it, that makes me sad. That makes me sad when someone has actually figured out something that would be beneficial in the game, and then they hold it from the other then, players. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, I agree with that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So let me let me ask you this. So so we, we we ended up here because you're asking, is it okay for players to compute probability at the table? Yeah, and right. I think it it right. generally is, except in right. which cases where it's slowing down the game, right? If we're all waiting for you to take your turn and you're sitting oh, there yeah. doing math, I mean, you know, oh, yeah. hey man, come on, yeah, take your turn. Yep, yep, <laughs> yeah. Well, obviously, I mean, obviously, you shouldn't you shouldn't be slowing the game down for that. Yeah. Um, but you know, we've played with uh, like I feel like we've played with referees who, you know, they're clearly making it up on the fly. Frankly, they're having us roll dice, and we yeah. could tell that they didn't actually have any target number in mind whatsoever, and they were looking at the die and then post hoc deciding yeah, on yeah. it. That's an easy trap to fall into, I feel like, and that's yeah. and that's something I've personally yeah. fought against. And there, I've I know I've had games now yeah. where we'll be doing something. Often it's because it's something unusual and you didn't anticipate it. So you're like, okay, I guess um, roll me an athletics check. And sometimes when somebody yeah. will start to roll the dice, I'll say, wait, I have to at least figure out what the target number is. Mm -hmm. Okay, now go because I don't want them right. to spoil my target number generation in my head by telling me what they yeah. rolled. Yeah, I I could not like encourage that practice more frankly if anybody doesn't do it that way i really highly encourage you to do it the way that paul does uh because at that point you're committed like you the dm has set the stakes you're committed and good or bad um uh, the, the main thing is you're committed to possibly something bad happening right. and without that it's so easy to fall in the trap of like i'm secretly a fan of my the player characters at the table and i'm gonna bend the world in their favor and once that starts happening, there's no end to it. So yeah. um, definitely set, having the DM setting the stakes in advance, that is that makes a huge difference in the play of the game. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. No, I'm definitely yeah. cool with the DM then interpreting the die roll versus that target number after the fact. If they right. if you want to say, Oh, you just made it by one and that's different from like you right. you know, got a nat twenty and you know, got more than double the number I was thinking of, and then, you know, narrating that effect, I, that's cool. I'm right. down with that. Right. Um, right. But yeah, right. yeah, I'd like, like to have the number in your head. Right. Uh, it's interesting. So, um, okay, okay, sorry, we're jumping around. I really like David Heron's topics. comment. I don't know if you can pull up David Heron's <laughs> yeah, comment, but yeah, I'm going sure. I'm gonna, I'm gonna to highlight that because that kind of warms my heart, actually. Um, let, me, let me find it real uh, quick here. The very last thing in the chat there. Sure. Oh, dear. Okay. So David's saying, uh, I think not setting a target number is a huge issue. It breaks the fundamental social contract. It's a betrayal. And I'm going to give that the official uh, uh, Wandering DM Dan uh, sanction of approval. Um, I think that it makes, and you know what, May, even if you don't feel quite so dogmatic about it, try it. Right, at, le at least try playing that style because we found it makes an enormous difference in the, the stakes and the tension and the drama of the game 
to, um, uh, to, to, be, to be playing that way with actual stakes ahead of you rather than post hoc deciding whether success or failure happened. Yeah, yeah. So granted that, okay, so granted, let, let's assume that we're okay with the players knowing the probabilities in the game and knowing, you know, being at least able to estimate their chances of success or failure and that it's not totally hidden from them. Then in that case, a you know a linear single die makes that easier. Yeah, it supports that. And of course, the classic, the traditional D and D mechanic of roll a d twenty, and there's some kind of linear addition or subtraction. That's why the d twenty was used in the first place, according mm -hmm. to John Peterson. Was that it's linear? It's easy to estimate probabilities, and players on both sides of the screen can use that to inform their strategic decision-making yeah. process. And as soon as you start putting additional dice in there, that becomes a much harder math calculation and much murkier yeah. at the table. Maybe some people like that. Throw a whole bunch of dice in, and all of a sudden, the probabilities become much murkier. And maybe that's what you want. So, of but course, you are getting away from yeah. players being able to yeah. estimate that. And the big, the big place where this comes up in the great, the great debate, uh, one of the things that we've liked to talk about a lot, Dan, is advantage and disadvantage in fifth edition, right? Mm -hmm. That in that case we're adding a die, right? Yeah, and right. and so we're changing it, and and that's I think one of the things we've argued in in the pros cons versus advantage disadvantage system, right. right? Definitely in the con category there is it's difficult to reason about. How yeah, big of a boost right. or penalty did I just give? I not totally sure. <clears throat> right. Right. And at that point, you're right back at the point that Peterson's talking about. You're right back at the point where why the word D20 is used in the first place was specifically to get away from rolling two dice yeah. and having the anomalous differences in probabilities between the, the middle of the curve and the upper part of the curve. Um, and for me, that's why, as a traditional D&D player, that's why the advantage-disadvantage mechanic really kind of grinds me the wrong way. Yeah. is specifically because it makes the analysis and the decision making a lot harder and really kind of a violation of why you're using a d20 in the first place <laughs> now i've seen it used um you know it, like uh, yeah. both in D and and i've seen there's a right. um a sci-fi game that i played recently uh whose name is failing to come to my brain that uses advantage disadvantage as a common uh mechanic yeah. right and there's a there's a certain elegance to it. Uh, it it's it's simple, right? It, especially um, oh, what the heck is the name of that game? Drat it. Um, anyway, the point was it was a it was a it was a little homebrew game, right? It was a you know small PDF uh, and and very very simplified. And that was like here's okay. their one mechanic for for dice. Uh, generally, you're rolling a d20 and trying to get this number, and you can have advantage, disadvantage, end of story. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so. There's some elegance to that, I think, in that it's very easy on the DM to just say, uh, okay, you should have advantage for this, right? Without having to think yeah. of a scalar yeah. of, oh, this deserves yeah. a plus two, or this deserves a plus yeah. four. Uh, but you could probably come up with an equivalent, right? What if you just said that advantage is always plus four? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> Rather than two you, dice, you could. get the highest. Yeah, you could. I, you know, I will obviously the advantage disadvantage mechanic of rolling two dice for advantage, rolling two dice and picking the bigger one is, is taking over all of gaming. It's taken over D and D it's taken over a bunch of other games that, that is rapidly, I mean, to my perspective, rapidly become the default modifier mechanic in most games. Mm. Obviously in D and D, uh, fifth edition, they almost made everything, almost made every situational modifier advantage notably accepting the cover rule that still has a, a plus two or a plus four in it. Uh, it's simple for people to understand. It's simple pe for people to engage with. I get that. Um, so it's very, very popular. You could. I mean, you know, I mean, I feel like that's not too too different from my, uh, you know, the replacing with a flat bonus is, is not too different from my historical instinct if I yeah. usually go for either two or four. Yep. So yep. usually I'm like, it's That's, either two, four, or six, yeah. basically. A little bit is two, a, a nice number is yeah. four, and a severe advantage is six. So that's usually what I'm what I'm judging. So that's there's an interesting fact, right? So that's this I think uh, is sort of the, the the yin and yang of of how much does a bonus impact a die versus the the other thing that I've seen in countless systems 
is yeah. the designation of the target number, right? This is especially when you're doing a right. rollover mechanic, right? Where you're going to say, right. okay, roll whatever dice it is, percentile, d20, dice pool, whatever, but you have a variable target number. And you say, okay, well, right. a 10 is a success and a 15 is an astounding success and a 20 is whatever, or, or the other way around, right? This challenge right. is a DC 12. This challenge is a DC 15, right? I, I, when those systems are too fine, I have a lot of trouble, mm -hmm. right? Right, yeah. and that, and we see this in in fifth edition D and D as well, right? Like if I'm making a right. trap, what is the DC to right. spot or disarm the trap? And you expect Agreed. it to scale with the difficulty of the trap and blah blah Agreed. blah, and you're trying to balance it for the level of your party, or you're thinking about the things that created it and how difficult should it be. It feels very nebulous. I feel like I'm never quite sure. Am I picking a good number? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Um, totally agree. Yeah. For for things that have you know specific um, hard rules behind them, such as armor class, right? I'm pretty happy because there's usually some specific calculation you can do for the armor class, and there doesn't there isn't this judgment call in the middle about that. Uh, for other things that's more uh, more nebulous, that's actually why I like in original D and D that most of that stuff's on a D six. Is it does feel like our like my ability to judge a completely brand new uh, probability level? I feel like I can get it in about you know uh, out of six pips. I feel like I, I'm pretty comfortable with picking that. But on a d20, I agree. It's, it is, there's too much there's too much granularity. Well, let's there. let's compare that between. This is an interesting yeah. difference, I think, between old school games, yeah. old school systems, and fifth edition. Right in yeah. in fifth edition. Uh, if I'm going to look for a trap, I'm probably going to make you roll an investigate roll, right? You mm -hmm. have some amount of skill in investigate, which is affected by your stats and your level, right? So it's right. not constant. And the mm -hmm. expectation set by the printed material would be that the difficulty of that investigation check goes up based on the difficulty of the content, right? If I'm running a mm -hmm. level yeah. one dungeon, probably the traps only need a DC 10 or 12 to find. If I'm running a level 10 dungeon, probably they need like a 15 or an 18 or something really high. Yep, agree. Whereas in the old school stuff, generally it's flat, right? It's, this is the chance to find a trap, end of story. Uh, by default, right? So usually yeah. there's a default book, like here's the here's the standard, and then if you look in uh, printed adventures, like perhaps Tomb of Horrors, it's quite likely they're going to say this trap is particularly hard, and it's uh, it, this many extra pips difficulty, perhaps. So at the same time, they were pretty willing to go into a high level adventure and adjust that. Okay. Um, I like right. So among the things about about original DMs, I like having a default success, so you don't have to write a number in every single trap, yes. right? So you can just write, yes, there's a track here, right, in yep. text, and not have to put in a number for every single door, window, trap, sidewalk, pavement tile. Um, and in the cases where you consciously decide to make it harder, you have the option of going in and saying, there's an adjustment here to the poison or the trap or whatever and that adjustment is two or four pips or whatever um and admittedly when you, when you switch to third edition and you have the we are committing to a dc for everything all of a sudden now you have to have numbers all through your text for everything yeah well i certainly like the idea of having a having a default number which is your your stock target could be a number like 20 i don't know um, and uh, only only needing to adjust that if you have a conscious reason to do so later. Yeah, yeah. I definitely I grappled this with this in the when I was writing up the rules for Ten Dead Rats. Um, right. So I knew in Ten Dead Rats I was trying to base it on on O D and D as much as possible, but I knew skills were going to become much more important because it's more hammer based, and we we're going to be doing a lot of that kind of that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so I made a little chart, and generally my what I want. When there's variable target numbers, what I want is a very small number of them, like maybe three. That's the level of variation I want, just so that I can say, like, well, this is easy or moderate or hard, and that's all I'm going to think about. Um, when, once it gets more finer detail than that, then I then that trips me up as a DM because I'm like, oh, I don't know, is this is this should this be hard or 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 moderately hard or somewhat hard right like uh, right. just give me a give me a standard roll and then let me bump it up or down that's yeah, what i, I want. agree right. um I agree. 
I, through through play now anyone who's looking at the if anyone's cracking open their their pdfs right now and looking at 10 dead rats i'll say actually i've adjusted the number since i printed this thing so i really should change it i think i started with a target of 15 as being the, the sort of box standard moderate roll and through play testing i've realized that 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 was too high and so i've dropped it down to 10 okay. um which is basically means an unskilled person uh, or a you know an average person making an average roll is a 50 50 shot right 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 interesting um the, the the funny thing from there is what i've also come to realize is that so from there i want to say well 10 is average 15 is pretty difficult uh -huh. and if i want to go easier don't roll okay yeah that's okay, sure. <laughs> that's where sure. that's the conclusion I, yeah. through play testing this was not a conscious decision okay. i made okay. at the time of, but through play testing i've decided right. if it's easier than that then just don't roll. Great. Great. I like it. And I, I like that it's battle tested and play tested. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. You know, I've seen people bad mouth play testing online recently. And I, it's been, I've, yeah, I've had to restrain myself from getting involved with that. Um, but I've seen people bad mouth the idea of play testing. But I mean, I think that's totally invaluable experience. And yeah. I would trust, I would trust yeah. your results at the table more than, <laughs> uh, more than if someone didn't do that. That's, that's, um, the yeah. Okay. Well, great. Well, now I feel better about my numbers. Thanks. I think that's a great. I think that's a great. And, you know, the other thing is, so since they're in, in increments of five, like there's ten and fifteen, it's still in my head that like when someone rolls a twenty or higher, I'm like, I should probably interpret that pretty favorably. Like, that's sort mm -hmm. of like yeah. you did really well. Um, right. Which right. brings us, which brings me to my next topic of sort of uh, right. levels of success, because I've seen that built into many okay. games, right? Yeah. Great. You have that like in Savage Worlds where you have raises. Um, yep. Warhammer Fantasy had that in a really mm -hmm. unfortunately difficult way to calculate, which was you're rolling percentile dice trying to get under a number, and for every increment of ten under that number is an extra oh. uh, a degree, an extra degree of success. So I have a 67 percent chance of success. If I roll a 57 or less, it's a one right. degree, and then everybody's yeah. doing a shit ton of math at the table trying to tell you. Because I say roll this skill, mm -hmm. and they tell, and they say, okay, great. I rolled a thirty-two, and I say, how many degrees of success is that? Uh, oh, right. um, hang on, <laughs> hang on. Yeah, that's <laughs> math. Yeah, yeah. Uh, fourth I mean, edition. Us, yeah, I, I have colleagues that yeah. would snort at that and go like, oh, that's we can all do that. That's easy, but you know, it's not immediate. It's for not immediate. Everybody, yeah. that's a yeah. little bit too complicated. Yeah. Honestly. Yeah. yeah. Totally. Uh, fourth edition interestingly did change this where they said um they still have degrees of success i don't remember if they still call it that but they said just stop using the the, the singles digit just don't use it just use okay. the tens digit for degrees of success like, oh, oh okay. i see yeah okay okay yeah, yeah it just, it just yeah, make, speeds it up a little bit right yeah. makes it a little less yeah. accurate but speeds it up yeah. a little bit what do you yeah. think about yeah. what do you think about the games that systemize and the quant the quality of the success or failure the the degree or amplitude of success and fail okay if it is because i have a couple different iterations on that in mm. my head uh now the very first thing is i always go to classic marvel superheroes right i go to face rip marvel superheroes with the universal table that yeah. for every yeah. role had four right four possible cases and God, I enjoy, you know, I enjoy that game so much. Of course, we had Jeff Grubb on the show a couple of weeks back to talk about his design of that. And I've enjoyed that game a lot. You know, one of the things I would say about that is it has specific results, right? In addition to the four colors in that same table for any action you're taking, shooting a thing, trying to punch a guy, mm -hmm. falling off a building, there is a very specific concrete result. It's not the referee needing to ad lib something from that level of success. So if it has if it has a very specific, again, predefined stake involved, I've had a lot of fun with, say, Marvel superheroes for that. I have no problem with that. Hmm. Um, you know, one game that some of us have been playing recently is Quest. And what Quest does is that they have three cases. They have total success, they have total failure, and there's a middle gray ground where the DM is supposed to give the player two kind of not great options to choose from. Hmm. And so anytime you, you hit this middle ground, the referee has to ad lib, uh, maybe this happens and it's not great, and maybe this happens and it's not great, and the player gets to choose. So there's some chaos that comes in there's some inter you know pro there's some interesting surprise unexpected stuff that might pop in 
con, I saw somebody on Twitter the other day saying they actually really didn't like that mechanic because they feel, as, as the referee, they feel a lot of pressure around that. Mm-hmm. Of every single time that happens, which is basically one in three, they have to come up with not one but two novel, surprising, interesting, improvised right, right. possibilities, and they actually felt a lot of stress around that. Yeah, I could see so, that. I could, that's, that's, a, so, that's a reasonable... I right. like the I like the notion that maybe it also adds a little bit right. of player influence, you know, a little point, an easy point for players to influence, uh, you know, how right. to, uh, right. you know, <clears throat> right. how to make the game go. But it's interesting. Have you played Quest, Dan? Yeah, we've been playing Quest uh, Friday nights the oh, last wow. uh, months awesome. or so, months awesome. or so. Yeah, awesome. yeah, great. Oh, I gotta, yeah. I gotta I, pick I, your I brain about it. that at some point. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> it's very cool. nice. Well, I mean, cool. Max is running it, so Max, so feel free to. Uh, all right. For, for, you're free to touch me. You can talk to me about what it's like to play Quest. You can yeah, talk yeah, to Max yeah. about, from Ten Dead Rats okay. about what it's like to run Quest. And okay. We've been having a lot of fun. Absolutely. So I have another example here of a mechanic, of a dice mechanic, where uh, it touches on two things we've talked about, which is knowing uh, or being able to, to comprehend just how likely or unlikely an event is to happen, and in sort of, um, and also in, in, uh, having to interpret uh, in unusual events. Um, and that's Savage World's notion of exploding dice. So right. let me explain that to anybody who doesn't know. The, the idea behind exploding dice in Savage Worlds, generally, you're rolling one type of die, you're looking for target number four, and the, and the, the way they adjust your ability is changing the die. So maybe you're rolling a d4, or d6, or d8, trying to get a four or higher. Um, but the notion is, no matter what type of die you're rolling, which again is variable based on your character, if you roll the highest value on that die, you get to re-roll it and add. So if you roll a 4 on a d4, roll again, get a 2, now your total is 6. Uh, less and less likely the bigger die you're using, but m- higher and higher the exponential increase goes, right? And ultimately it's totally un- unbounded, even on just a d4, right? I could just keep rolling 4s, man, and just add, 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 up to forever. Yep. Yep. Um, which... I will say, I love it. I absolutely adore exploding dice. Um, I, it, it, can I predict what's going to happen with exploding dice? No. Uh, but the interesting thing is, because I know it's a target number four and you have this die type, I know most of the graph, right? It's just the high end. It's that swoop at the end where it suddenly goes okay. bloop up to the top. And so I know that there's like, generally I kind of know the probability until the very high end of success where it might skew wildly. And I really enjoy that, especially for a system where generally I'm using it for horror games. And in horror right. games, what I want is I want a period of the game where um, what you're doing is fairly uh, normal, right? Uh, fairly average. We're, we're playing to our skills. We still think the world is normal. We haven't yet encountered the horrible element. And so generally you should be pretty good at that. You just like you're, you're professionals, do your thing. And then I want to introduce the, the moment of horror which is just way out of bounds for what you're capable of handling and is probably going to kill you. And the nice thing about the exploding dice is even then, there's still a chance that your character, even though I've totally stacked it against you, probably this huge demon is going to swallow your soul. Right. Maybe you'll behead it. Could happen. <laughs> it's not bad. It's not bad. I see, no. uh, I see David in the, the, the chat saying that players love exploding dice. I can see why. Um, admittedly, as someone that likes uh, being able to estimate in advance the probabilities and analyze it and use that table, it does frustrate me a little bit that that is too complicated for me to either intuit or yeah. uh, remember. Um, and so I feel, you know, compared to where, okay, and admittedly, I, I mostly, you know, run games as DM usually. Uh, I'm accustomed to sort of being in control of the mechanics. And so when I sit down in a Savage World game with exploding dice, I'm a little bit at sea uh, <laughs> over that. Um, but, you know, I can see the attraction of it providing a surprise or an yeah. unexpected yeah. or a bit of an unknown. Particularly in a horror game where you want yeah. some unknown in the game, yeah. that's actually not a bad model of that. It's right? definitely, and it's a, it's a, it's not only... It's a it's it's almost always a high drama moment, right? Somebody's dice explode yeah. and on a, right. and the roll was important and they're going, Oh goody, 
right? And then, and right. and and even better, like it crescendos. Then I did it again. I did it. I exploded again, right? right? And then just yeah. everybody gets really into it, right? And it has this this moment of of yeah. rising tension, where you realize that you've you've just exploded off the end of the chart, and something really crazy is about to happen in the game. Um, yeah. And again, though, from my end as DM, I like it as an excuse for me to say, like, well, now the pressure is on me, and it's pressure that I want to invent right. and improvise something crazy, right. Right? right? Like, oh my gosh, this wild, wild thing just happened. Let, let me say this. The mm -hmm. times that I've been playing Savage Worlds and I've seen dice explode by three or four, you know, multipliers, I've been a little uh, disappointed in the effect. Like I've actually never, like the effect is usually not as enormous as I would honestly expect from that. So I feel there, again, the fact that it turns into this, it does turn into this subjective thing on the part of the referee and the referee frequently has a scenario and has an idea in mind about kind of how it's going to go. Um, I've, I'm usually uh, a little bit surprised at, at how little difference the exploding dice make. Like, frankly, if, I, if there are four successes in a row, I expect just like encounters over, everybody's incinerated, kapow, <laughs> game over I and um, usually it's a little more nuanced than that one of one of my favorite moments in a savage worlds game in a savage worlds horror game came from an exploding dice moment where um a player was playing a uh a detective had a handgun uh and was in a situation where they were um uh riding on the back of an, an ancient red dragon like you do mm -hmm. right? right and 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 just the was that was not part of the setting that was horrific and crazy and they didn't know what the hell was going on how like through circumstance ended up jumping on the thing as it swooped by and is now like oh god what's going to happen so he shoots it in the back of the head with his gun and the dice explode and he just does massive 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 amounts of damage and so we had this delightful moment where i'm like well okay this dragon that no one was supposed to be able to kill you've just killed you're on its back and it's in flight so it comes crashing to the ground I rolled massive damage on the guy riding on the back from all the falling damage of tumbling down. So then I decide, and which kills him. So then I interpret that as like, okay, you came down crashing through the trees and a branch caught you and beheads you and your head goes rolling off onto the, onto the <laughs> ground. So it was like, it was crazy, right? It's just this huge, yeah, yeah. huge event. And uh, all that from, from like a totally unexpected, ridiculous last ditch effort combined with uh, exploding dice. I mean that's fantastic. I wish yeah. I was part of that. Day. I have yet to see, right? Yeah, I've not yet seen to that. See such such a okay. uh, spectacular uh, overkill event from exploding <laughs> dice. I wish that I'd been yeah. part of that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's great. Well, well yeah. certainly not not every not every exploding dice story ends as as in an as exciting a way. I'm sure. Right. right. But you know, I'll say like that them. like right in in third edition D and D, they had an optional rule that we were using for. Uh, roll a natural 20, get a crit. You get a crit. Okay, in third edition, it was you get a crit possibility. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, in order to actually get your double damage or whatever, you had to roll a second two hit roll, succeed at that, um, to actually get the critical hit. And then there was an optional rule that if, if that second one came up 20, and then you did a third confirmed hit, that that would be an automatic kill result. And so in our third edition game, we decided to use that optional rule, never came up. Uh, the player, I think I was running, I'm pretty sure I was running it. Uh, the players went to hell through a trap, were trapped in a hellscape with a demon that could only be uh, 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 attacked by highly magical weapons, um, put down the entire party, except for the paladin of our good friend BJ. Uh, BJ broke his sword, had no magical sword, and then said, "Well, I just, I just go hand to hand and grab the demon by the horns and try to try to attack him physically with my fists. And by God, if it exact that exact moment, BJ didn't roll twenty twenty hit and automatically <laughs> kill the demon barehanded to save the party. Yep. And I got to admit, look, you know, is that is that a is that a traditional part of first edition D and D? No. Yep. Is it part of original D and D? No." Um, and that's one of my favorite gaming moments ever. And you're not going to forget something like that. Yep. Yep. Um, yep. And maybe I should be maybe I should be working more. Uh, maybe I should be more working more unbounded results. I'm pretty convinced. But 
you know, your stories and the possibility of like a magical effect. Yeah. Or something like maybe critical hits, and maybe that's another maybe that's yeah. a whole other discussion we should have another yeah, day. Probably, probably about using critical yeah. hits for that same unbounded effect uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. idea. Yeah, certainly. I think you want to know what is the style of game I'm running. Is it conducive to this sort of thing, right? Like, as much as I enjoy um, exploding dice in Savage Worlds for uh, games that have a uh, for my horror games and generally games that I think Savage Worlds is best at, which is stuff like pulp adventure. Uh, do I want that in like my standard fantasy games? I don't think so. I don't think I do. Right? It definitely affects the tone of the game. Right. Right. I agree. I agree. <laughs> you know, one thing I should say is over in the chat, uh, you know, some people have been putting uh, statistics, and so there's been big. I don't know. It, it might not do us any good to pull it up, but for example, Kansas Dave has been kind enough to post the entire distribution chart of Advantage D20s. <laughs> and I can, just out of my eye, I can confirm that he's right. I can okay. confirm that he's right, Great. actually. I'm not, I'm so not going to put it on can, screen because there's no way it's going to show up properly. Right. You probably shouldn't. <laughs> but here at Wandering DMs, <clears throat> we highly appreciate the the statistical uh, uh, nuance, and we really thank you for, for, for sharing that with all yeah. of us because that was... That was useful in the chat. Well, let's let's get on to the last bullet in my notes here, which I think yeah, maybe we'll we'll get into the thing that you were writing code for just at the beginning of this show. Um, and I debugged it while you were. <laughs> well, <laughs> it was, excellent. It was, a, it was a really bad problem, and I actually have managed to debug it in excellent. the last 45 great, minutes. Great, great. <laughs> That's a new feature of uh, Wandering DMs. Uh, you can expect live coding debugging happening while while we talk. Uh, so what I want to talk about is is group roles, right? Um, yeah. And we can maybe talk about in general, like any case where where you're going to want to say yeah. take take some event that's happening and and use multiple roles, right? Yeah. Uh, so mo this happened a lot in the big bad, right? We and we saw a lot of comments and discussion about this in the chat, uh, which is the case of the whole party wants to as a group sneak from point A to point B, what do you do? Do they all individually roll their stealth rolls? Do you do some kind of group roll? Uh, do you have, you know, everybody rolls but a certain number of successes is what you're looking for, right? Like I've seen a lot of different takes on this. Gotcha. Um, gotcha. What's your preference, Dan? Well, I should say that, you know, where this comes from, and, and again, we've we played third edition for a number of years, where this comes from is in the third edition era where they had formalized spot and hide might have been different names, mm -hmm. but basically a formal spot and hide check. And the default rule would just be a bunch of people roll your hide checks, a bunch of people on the other side roll your spot checks. And if any spot beats a hide, you've, you've uh, noticed someone trying to sneak by you. Um, I, think, I think many of us will argue, not everybody, but many of us will argue that that rapidly becomes uh, uh, a lost cause for the people trying to sneak. And that's why these. Um, edits or alterations the rule come up in an attempt to ameliorate that yep. uh, that very steep probability cliff. Uh, for me, I think that my... Um, okay, now do I run games that have spot and hide checks? I actually haven't for a long time at this point. So um, at this point, like if I was running a D20 based skill system, I got to a point where I wanted what the hell was I doing? I think I was like the worst sneaker rolls, but they get a benefit from the person leading them, and the best, uh, the best spotter rolls, and they also get a benefit for the number of people helping <laughs> them. <laughs> so that there was one roll on both sides with bonuses in each direction. I think that's that's actually doing. a pretty. I actually kind of like that, right? So yeah. so one of the problems yeah. I have, right, with anything of like, oh, we're gonna do a group roll. We're gonna have either one person roll, or we're gonna mm -hmm. we're gonna all roll and try to hit X number of successes. Um, yeah. Is is the well? Let me let me just go with back to the group roll. You're one person gonna roll for us. Um, is it goes back to for me another uh, wonderful B J Johnson quote of uh, you know quiet as ten quiet men, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> Mm, no, actually, you know, a larger group is less stealthy than one person. Right. Like it just right. is. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> doesn't, right. Doesn't work. That's some of the best quotes ever. Really. Um, uh, I'm as quiet. Ten quiet men. Ten quiet men. Mm, how no, wait, that's bad. <laughs> that's, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. terrible. Um, um, yeah, it's totally yeah. true. Uh, but if you are rolling, right? If you are actually yeah. rolling 
you know, four dice on one side and four dice on the other, it becomes impossible to, to it's just right. totally impossible right. practically to simplify. Right. And um, if everybody's going to roll, could, like, very at likely... At any point you want, Paul, I yeah. can run a Monte Carlo simulation over here of exactly yeah. any particular model you would like. I mean, okay. let me just, I'll just quiz you about this. Let's say you have two parties of four people. You have four mm -hmm. people trying to sneak, and you have four people trying to spot, and they all have equal skill. So there, there yep. isn't even the, like, one person's good and one person's bad. Great. They just have equal skill on both sides. Mm -hmm. What is the chance that the four... Uh, the, the four spotters will spot the four people sneaking by. Four versus four. You know, uh, one of twenty. So it's, I guess how how are you ultimately? So so you're making eight total rolls. Correct. Yeah. What, what are you taking like the best roll from each group? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Presumably, presumably, as long as someone on the spotting team, you know, beats somebody's hide check, well, the, I, I'm assuming that they spotted that particular person at least. Oh, gotcha, gotcha, so, you know, gotcha. Some, right. So, so really, yeah. what you're doing is, oh my gosh, what are you doing then? You're comparing the best roll against the worst roll at that point. Sure. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. that okay. winds up happening. Yeah. Okay. So that's got to be quite quite likely that you're going to spot them, right? I'm going to say mm -hmm. uh, above ninety percent off the top of my head. Uh, you're right. You're right. Uh, yeah. Ninety above ninety eight percent. Okay. Actually, crazy. Yep. Yeah. Uh, it's actually uh, no, when I'm getting nine. I'm getting ninety eight point nine six percent. So I guess you might as well just call that ninety nine percent likely yep. to be spotted. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it'd be very very quickly. Uh, never mind larger teams than that. It just becomes well. You've automatically spotted them. There's really no chance you can right. possibly sneak right. by. So something like uh, turn it into a single roll or use the the eight another uh, rule. For some kind of bonus at least at least makes it not automatic right right i do like that i mean i also do want a system that's going to take into account the relative skill right because that's another problem you see with your yes. average D D group is that probably you have one person who's quite stealthy and one person who's not stealthy at all and is actually really sure. terrible at it and sure. i think once you put those two people together and they're sneaking together Surely it's right. more important how the unstealthy person did than how the stealthy person did, right? Sure, Agreed. maybe the stealthy person is helping in some way, and again, I agree, like, yes, give them a bonus or something, but I would make the worst guy roll, not the best guy in terms of stealth. Mm -hmm. Likewise, I on spot, I, th I, I think you're right, right? Like, this is a case of, well, the best spotter is probably the most important. Right. Right. Yeah, that's what I came from in the past when I did the same kind of analysis, and I was, I was pretty happy with that. I was pretty happy with that. Okay. I mean, but you know, both for uh, it makes an interesting as usual. You kind of want to hit both buttons. It makes for an interesting game that it's not just automatic failure or success, and it seems fairly reasonable. It seems yeah. like that's, now, that feels like about what ought to happen. Actually, interesting, interesting comments here. Uh, let me let me let me toss this into the mix. Uh, so Eric says, in five E, many times I'm using passive perception versus group stealth. Majority need to succeed. Mm -hmm. um, right. Now, uh, interesting. I think passive perception and passive is is a, an interesting concept, right? So we were using that in the Big Bad. Right. Uh, so in the right. early stages, I knew the passive perception of all the bad guys, and then I had the players um, rolling stealth. And the interesting thing I found there was it was never totally clear to me whether, uh, like, what happened in, in, in that kind of role on a tie. Because I think the right. point of passive perception is just that you're kind of taking the average as if you had rolled in a contested role. But mm -hmm. it also feels a bit like I've set the DC for a skill check. We are rolling a skill here, right? So the DC of this right. skill check happens to be 13, which right. normally equaling would, would, would win. Anyway, I found that an interesting kind of like a little slightly gray area oh, where I, I had to talk about, oh, I had to really kind of break down where's this number that they're trying to hit coming from? Is Am I using the passive perception as a substitute for a contested role or am I using it to set the DC of a skill check? I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Because they're kind of different, I think. Which yeah, is that is unfortunate. actually kind of an interesting wrinkle. Yeah. Have you have you looked that up? I and mean, what is what is the official? Do you know, I remember looking it up, but I don't remember what the yeah. actual uh, end result yeah. was. Apart from me kind of being yeah. somewhat confused by it and going like, "Ah, oh, this is eh. um, interesting." Yeah. <laughs> it, it uh, like, what's your instinct right this second? Like, wait, like right this second, which way would you go about that? If you I would probably it use it as if I was setting the. I would not. I would probably use it as if I was setting the DC of a skill check, just because okay. I think it's less complicated my head. Okay. Than, so in that case, ties, ties go to the sneakers, what you're ties, saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Because because my instinct would be the opposite. My instinct yeah. would be normally, at least the games I played before, if there's a tie between spot and hive, the spotter has spotted them. So I would actually go the opposite hmm. way. Hmm. Yeah, I can see that. I can see the wrinkle there. Interesting. Right. Uh, David is pointing out that it's because it's actually much more complicated for the way contested roles ties get evaluated in fifth edition. I think we're given some weird oh, no. language to say like the state of the game doesn't change. And you have to interpret what the hell that means. Yeah, it's 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 very hazy and unfortunate. Err, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, not. Yeah. Err. yeah, yeah, yeah. So Err. in this case, uh, right? Actually, I'm gonna just chuck what David put Weird. in because he's totally right. Uh, he wrote uh, in contests, you don't change the state of the game. So I would rule they were hidden, so they remain hidden. Hmm. But the, the, does that include? Does that include like they get by? Like they get so they successfully get by? It feels. Yeah, I think they 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 technically succeed, right? Huh. They huh. crazy. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. It's 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 an oddity. Huh. Um, okay. I remember watching in Critical Role. They did some interesting things, uh, interesting mechanical things where. Um, uh, this is this is a bit out there, but uh, uh, <clears throat> not not specifically about stealth, but uh, just thinking of generally like like many roles or contested roles or long ongoing checks. Uh, I remember seeing Mercer do some stuff where he said like, okay, it's very difficult to get to climb up to the top of the mountain, mm -hmm. so I need you to make you know three out of five successful checks. Yeah. But I'm going to let you tell me what skills there are. You can tell me what skill you're using and how that helps you get up the mountain. Which I thought was pretty interesting. Yeah, I'm not that. I'm not that fond of that kind of. <clears throat> I, I got to admit that's, you know, that starts to go in towards storytelling game. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. mechanics of the players get to decide how the world works, and certainly I'm I'm more fond of the players saying I try to do this, and the DM decides what the mechanics are. Right. Uh, admit, admittedly, I'm not. That's a little. That's a little new school for it, me. It cut both ways for me because on the one hand, I like that it's trying to emulate that. It's a long effort, right? It takes a long time for us to get right. up the mountain, and a lot of different things yeah. happen, and we're just gonna let yeah. you know some some chaos in here to dictate. Yeah. What are the unusual, interesting things that happen along the way? Right. On the other hand, sometimes players came up with gold and it was really interesting and they came up with fun story and sometimes they were looking at their character sheet and were like well I'm really good at persuasion so I'm going to roll a persuasion check and then Mercer's got to be like well, how does that help you get up a mountain yeah. <laughs> yeah what were the options that were accepted what were the other options that, so I'm like okay climb or in 5th edition athletics what, it was uh, literally anything you want any skill you want you tell me what skill you're using and I will come up with a way for or we will come up with so a way together. So would he actually accept persuasion? I think so. I don't think it was ever that extreme. Uh, but yes, there was there was some odd yeah. skill checks in there where it was like, yeah, yeah. yeah that, <laughs> bothers, that bothers me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. man, that bothers me. Okay. Interesting. Well, you know, people, great. People love Critical Role. They do a great job. <laughs> wonderful. Many wonderful things happen there. Uh, Can't support them more highly. Bring attention to the game. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to wash my palate out on that one. That's um, great. That's uh, great. You know, if someone built if someone built a thief who's good at climbing, I'd be pretty irritated at like, the, having the discovering that you can just declare that my, you know, that my, my intimidation skill works against cliffs. Yeah. Uh, I mean, again, I think maybe you're thinking of the specific challenge too narrowly. Like, it was literally like we're going to go many miles up the side of this mountain, right? So there's probably several cliffs, and maybe there's also, maybe we also encounter, you know, some people along the way, or maybe, right? Like, I think the, the point was to encompass a large, long, uh, you know, thing that happened, but to, to compress it down quickly, right? We know that the journey up the side of this mountain should be difficult and lots of interesting things should happen, but we don't want to spend hours of gameplay on it. So we're just kind of, you know, here's a couple highlights, boom, boom, boom. You know, I'll say mountain climbing in specific is something that's actually always frustrated me a little bit in, in uh, role-playing games like D&D, and I actually kind of wish that there was a mini game available specifically for interesting mountain climbing, like a game like you know, climb to Mount Edwurst or something like that. Yeah. That actually dealt with, you know, dealt with the, the actual details of that kind of action, 
Uh, now here I am going off on a tangent yeah, that yeah. probably some players would get irritated about when you roll out the mini game, but um, uh, I've always thought that mountain climbing is not, you know, or something like Lieber's uh, Fafford and Grey Mouser story, uh, Stardock, where the whole story is the intricate uh, difficulties that they take climbing the the world's tallest mountain to some mysterious point on the top, and I've always wanted that kind of action that uh, that you know classically isn't really in D and D. So mm -hmm. um, that's a particular interesting interesting okay. case where I do wish there Wait, was more detail. Maybe, specifically in maybe I chose a poor example by talking about a mountain. If they had to get totally across from one edge of the swamp to the other, does that make it any different for you? <laughs> <laughs> I wish that there was more swamp, swamp <laughs> minigame action T and D, yeah. and uh, okay. it's something that I've been looking for for a while. Great. So um, we're running out of time here. So uh, unfortunately, the swamp crossing minigame will have to wait for another for another day. <laughs> Um, great. I don't think we got quite as deep as we were hoping into the math here, Dan. Um, so I apologize for that. Count your blessings, count yeah. your blessings, uh, uh, viewers. Um, we could have we could have tried out more, but but some people helped us, Paul, actually in the chat. Great, uh, uh, such as David, as a matter of fact. So we really appreciate uh, we really appreciate that. Um, awesome. Probably good. To, yeah. So hopefully that puts a cap on on dice. Uh, obviously, there's just a lot, a lot of, a lot of stuff. There's a lot of different ways we've been using dice for a long time. Uh, yeah. Viewers, if you feel like we missed something dreadfully important, please leave us a, a note. Uh, leave us a comment in the video here. Tell us about uh, interesting, unusual dice mechanics that you've encountered or that we failed to cover. Uh, we'd love to hear about it. Maybe that will inspire dice episode number three. Probably, probably exploding dice. <laughs> Our dice explode, Paul, in episode three. Uh, we were, but we really would. I feel like there's probably a couple of things we didn't manage to get to in this hour. So yeah, yes, yeah. we definitely very much appreciate comments about things we could we could expand on this in the future. Um, also, I should remind our viewers or listeners that um, if you're new to the show, you can like, follow, and subscribe to us on sites such as Twitter and Twitch and YouTube and Facebook, and we do have the handle. Wandering DMs, all one word on all those sites. So please look for us there. If you prefer to listen to our lovely voices and not see our uh, smiling faces, you can uh, get the podcast, the audio-only podcast version of our show on our website, wanderingdms.com. It's uh, also available on various podcast carriers, such as Google Podcast and iTunes and Spotify. If you're listening to us from one of those other sources, please take a moment to leave a review or a rating or whatever they support on that site. Uh, that helps other folks find our show, and we really appreciate it. Uh, we really do. And as usual, we have to thank our growing list of patrons who support the Wandering DM show and everything that we do. If you would like to join our generous patrons in supporting the Wandering DMs, please do visit patreon.com slash wandering DMs. You'll see the number of different tier levels that we have available and benefits such as discounts on merch, uh, polls on what you want to see our, on our blogs or future episodes, and uh, live chat in our discussion uh, in our Discord server that we have uh, immediately after every show, such as we'll be doing today, and a bunch of other cool stuff that we're planning on in the new year. Um, I think, what if I, what I, what I forget this time, Paul? Um, don't forget that, um, speaking of the new year, that um, right. the channel will be going dark at the end of December as we take our, mm -hmm. our traditional annual break at the end of December to go uh, visit our loved ones and convince them that we still uh, breathe air. So... <laughs> um, uh, so next uh, next week will be our last episode for the year, and then we'll be on break for a couple of weeks, and uh, we'll be back in January. Correct. So possibly uh, possibly an extra long episode uh, next Sunday, as a matter of fact. Maybe. Right. So be on the lookout for that. Possibly some guests that we'll be having with us. Uh, also, don't forget about uh, Paul's 10 Dead Rats live play show this Thursday. Their final episode of the season will be occurring this Thursday from 8 to 10 p.m., so please uh, yes. check in on that if you would. Um, uh, and also look for our uh, GitHub account where we upload uh, the code that we write during the show. That uh, this is the stuff that I've been debugging while we've been talking, and and, uh, and many other media sites that you can you can follow Wandering the MZ. Excellent, right, Paul? Isn't that right? Yeah, <laughs> sure. Right, sure. follow I us on go. GitHub, please. <laughs> right. 
<laughs> I really want to see the Wandering DM's GitHub account. <laughs> we should totally make that. <laughs> oh, jeez. This is now. Now, in in Wandering DM's tradition, what's going to happen is about six months from now, our very popular and highly marketed uh, software that we released on GitHub will have some notes about pointing back to remember that time at the end of that show when we came up with this stupid idea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's how that works. <laughs> 2020, it's a mind trip, man. It's, 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 there's your chaos, Paul. You happy yeah, with that great. now? I love it. I love great. it. Good. What else? Oh, you know what? We are live every Sunday at 1 p.m. Eastern time while our season is ongoing. So, yeah, uh, please do join us uh, uh, next week for the last episode of uh, the season of 2020. Uh, join us for a very special episode, uh, December 13th, and uh, hopefully we'll have another thought-provoking discussion that time. Join us then. We'll see you then.